Wait, 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 wait. He's calling off the attacks? Okay, most of the attacks? But he's, he's never done that before. He's always like, attack, attack, attack. What changed? Uh-huh. 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 Wow. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Talk to you later. Yeah. October 16th, 1942. Remain at your command post. It's not just an order. It's a symbol for your whole nation of your tenacity, your refusal to give in, your refusal to lose. But when the crisis comes, is it just words after all? I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the River Volga itself was on fire in Stalingrad as the Germans mounted mighty attacks on the Soviet defenders. But by the end of the week, the big action had quieted down as the attackers await reinforcements. On Guadalcanal, reinforcements were being brought in by both sides as the island assumes greater and greater importance. That continues this week. The American and Japanese reinforcement operations were piling in for a collision in the dark waters of Iron Bottom Sound. Every night, the Rat Express, as it was called by the Imperial Army, was ferrying in 150 troops on each destroyer, while float planes from Admiral Mikawa's covering heavy cruisers, dubbed Washing Machine Charlies by the Marines, dropped fragmentation bombs. Warnings by the Coast Watchers sent the dive bombers of the Cactus Air Force out to try to derail these Tokyo Expresses as they raced each afternoon up the slot. They aren't actually doing so for a few days early this week, so Mikawa can gather force for a big run the night of the 11th. He will have Aritomo Goto's three cruiser force for bombardment support, and 11th Air Fleet Command assures him the Allies' Henderson Field on Guadalcanal will be bombed out of commission. Well, the afternoon of the 11th, some 90 Japanese planes do arrive to bomb Guadalcanal, but with the cloud cover, they do little damage and dogfights are at a minimum. I should note that many of the fighters are short range zeros that have flown in from the now completed airfield at Buin, which gives the Japanese a lot more aerial firepower. They prevent American planes from finding the reinforcement convoy, but B-17s spot the wake of the support group in the slot. So Admiral Scott, who arrived last week, sends his four cruisers and six destroyers at top speed to intercept the enemy off Savo Island. He is determined to avenge the U.S. Navy's defeat there in August. He has, in fact, done the same procedure the nights of the 9th and the 10th, but the Japanese do not turn up. On the 11th, they do. In spite of losing two of his four scout planes, he locates the enemy while still maintaining total surprise. He does have radar issues. His flagship, Cruiser San Francisco, only has larger wave SC search radar, unlike the newer centimeter wave SG radar his light cruisers have. Also, they think the Japanese could pick up radio on SC frequencies, which would mean that they were telegraphing their positions instead of just reading the Japanese ones though the Japanese cannot do that. But the SC radar is turned off. 10.50 p.m., Japanese warships are spotted heading for the passage between Savo and Cape Esperance, the northernmost point on Guadalcanal. Scott brings his battle line around and crosses the T, meaning that he's crossing the enemy's head and can bring all of his guns to bear on them. At 11.46 p.m., they open fire. Surprise was complete and utter. Admiral Goto believed that his ships were firing on his own transports. He never lived to appreciate his error because Aoba's bridge was hit seconds later by a shell and the mortally wounded Admiral was heard muttering over and over, stupid bastards, before he expired. Well, according to that source, others say that he was mortally wounded, sure, but died after being told that they had sunk two American cruisers. However, Scott soon worries that he is firing on his own destroyers in the dark. And without radar to see what they are, he calls a four-minute ceasefire to check ID lights, though the firing does not entirely cease. Two Japanese cruisers are on fire, and they're all turning to run. When Scott's force begins firing again, San Francisco blows a Japanese destroyer apart right off, and the cruiser Furutaka is hit enough to slow it behind its retreating comrades. After another ceasefire at midnight, so Scott can reform his line, the Japanese fire back with guns and torpedoes, 
before heading off into the darkness. This whole action so far takes 20 minutes. This is the first Japanese loss at sea ever in a night action, and they lose a cruiser and a destroyer and have another cruiser badly damaged. One American destroyer is too badly damaged to save and is run aground, and a cruiser and two destroyers are damaged. Thing is, although this is a victory, Scott's task force has driven off the bombardment force, but not the destroyer transports, who take advantage of the battle to unload all their troops and heavy artillery pieces and then head away undetected. They do, though, send destroyers back on the 12th to look for survivors, and two of them are sunk from the air. The Allies are determined to deny the Japanese continued nighttime control of the waters off Guadalcanal. So they've established a base also at Tulagi and brought in PT boats. The transport convoy of the Americal Division that set sail last week arrives the 13th, and these first U.S. Army soldiers to reach Guadalcanal get a very warm welcome indeed that very night. Harukichi Hayukutake's big offensive to take the island once and for all begins this day with two huge air raids, which light up 5,000 gallons of aviation fuel, wreck planes on the ground, and put the main runway of Henderson Field out of action. Then, artillery pieces out of range of American retaliation start shelling the field from afar. It all continues 93 minutes after midnight as battleships Congo and Haruna start lobbing 14-inch shells in from 15 kilometers offshore. When this stops at around 2.30 a.m., only seven of the American bombers total are still operational. The fighter strip is in better shape, and 24 of the 42 Wildcats are still functional. Only 41 men die of the 20,000 on the island, which seems miraculous to me. Hayukutake's field headquarters is like 30 kilometers east of the American positions on Guadalcanal, and he's planning the ground attack next week when his men are in position. Isoroku Yamamoto, commander of the Japanese Combined Fleet, has the second and third fleets blockading the approaches to the Solomon Islands. Four battleships, five carriers, 10 cruisers, and 29 destroyers, and his ships bombard Guadalcanal the rest of the week. The Allies managed to bring in some aviation fuel by submarine, but Chester Nimitz and his staff soberly assessed the situation. It now appears we are unable to control the sea in the Guadalcanal area. Thus, our supply of the positions will only be done at great expense to us. The situation is not hopeless, but it is certainly critical. However, for the Japanese, after the fighting at the end of last week, the impact of the loss of the line of the Matanikau, and especially the assembly and artillery positions on its east bank, can scarcely be exaggerated, as they were the very crux of the operation's plan for the October offensive. The high-speed reinforcement convoy makes its anchorage at Tassafaranga the night of the 14th. Some 4,500 men reinforce the Japanese on Guadalcanal to over 15,000 total, though they do lose three transports. Heavy cruisers bombard the fighter strip the night of the 15th, and though 46 planes have been basically destroyed over three nights of bombardment, and others are shot down, the Americans have been desperately flying in planes, and repair crews have worked the strips feverishly. On the 16th, the Cactus Air Force still flies 58 sorties, and Carrier Hornet launches 74 sorties, leading to her discovery by Japanese recon planes. There is plenty of aerial action this week. On the 10th, the Luftwaffe begins a 10-day assault on Malta with 600 planes attacking in waves of 100. The planes are based in Sicily. On the 12th, a British Liberator bomber sinks German sub U-597 in the Atlantic, this is the first success that RAF Coastal Command Squadron has, but even though these long-range planes can do a lot, another squadron is not yet in the cards. And at sea, the 12th through 17th, Allied Shipping Convoy SC-104, 44 merchant ships and escorts, is attacked by a 13-strong U-boat wolf pack. Eight merchant ships are sunk during the battle, but so are three submarines. And on the 14th, the German auxiliary cruiser Comet, a commerce raider, is torpedoed and sunk in the channel by a British torpedo boat while trying to reach the Atlantic to begin her second raiding voyage. The first lasted 516 days. Also on the 14th, Adolf Hitler suspends all offensive actions except Stalingrad 
and the middle reaches of the Terek River in the Caucasus. This is Operations Befeil number one, and says that success in the winter campaign will set the ground for the final destruction of the Red Army in 1943. In the Caucasus, the Soviets recapture Mount Oplepek after attacks the 7th through 13th against the Gebirg's Corps flanks. But German 17th Army Commander Richard Ruoff has finally gotten enough supplies to restart his offensive with all three corps at his disposal. He does so the 14th, pushing back and then breaking through 56 army defenses. The Soviets are pulling back in the direction of Tuops. And as for Stalingrad, on the 11th, for the first time in two months, there is a complete lull in the Stalingrad sector. On the 12th, Alexander Rakitsky, head of operations for the Soviet 37th Guards Division, defending the Krasny Oktyabr factory, documents Vasily Chuikov and Viktor Zholudev's meeting. Zholudev commands the Guards Division, Chuikov the whole 62nd Army. The meeting is at Zholudev's command post. There was real tension in the air when Chuikov returned. He told Zholudev that according to the latest reconnaissance information, Paulus was ready to throw everything into the assault. The Germans were determined to storm Stalingrad without further delay. Their main blow would be directed against the tractor factory. If they broke through, they would roll up our front, striking south along the Volga embankment. A very strong shock group was being created for this purpose, consisting of five divisions. About 30,000 fresh German troops were arriving in Stalingrad for the offensive. Chuikov told us the blow was being prepared for October 14th. And on October 14th, 1942, all hell breaks loose in Stalingrad. I will quote John Erickson, who describes it so well that his description is even quoted in Michael Jones's book, right? That assault, bringing with it the most stupendous surge of fighting which Stalingrad would ever see, opened at 8 a.m. on Monday, October 14th, 1942. Five German divisions, three infantry and two panzer, 300 tanks with mighty air support moved off in one great wall of steel and fire to overrun the factory districts, to break through to the Volga in strength, and to blot out the Soviet 62nd Army once and for all. Aerial attacks come first, and when the artillery finds its range, the gigantic bombardment is 90 minutes long. Chuikov has his forward units using a tactical innovation, though, moving forwards to prepared advanced positions just 50 meters from the enemy when the bombardment begins. Staff officer Anatoly Mareshko describes it as putting their claws to the enemy's throat and holding him close, as close as possible. The idea is that the Germans won't be able to bombard them without hitting their own men. And it's a fairly good idea for distant artillery. But the dive-bombing Stukas respond with precision bombing right above the rooftops. When the ground attack comes in mid-morning, it comes along a four-kilometer front. The smoke has blotted out the sun. The shelling is one long roar, and visibility is only a few meters in the factory district. Rakitsky, iron was melting. Fire and death were all around us. The Germans didn't believe anyone could survive. But not only do they survive, when the Germans advance, the entire Soviet front comes alive. German command is shocked, and the first assault is repelled. The second assault sees the remains of the buildings between Barricadi and the tractor plant change hands a few times, and just before noon, German machine gunners, backed by 200 panzers, break through Zholudev's lines, grinding through the Soviet strongpoints and into the rear of the 112th Division. By the late afternoon, the Soviet divisions are threatened with encirclement. Encircled Soviet units reported their positions by radio and continued to fight until their ammunition ran out. After that, there was only silence. The radio's dead. Every fighting man killed at his post. The Soviets do not want to use the radio, but there are no other communication options this day. Telephone wires having melted, and the Germans can intercept and monitor Soviet radio traffic. They search the signals to identify the Soviet command posts and specifically target them throughout the day, blowing them to pieces. When Zholudev's command post is blown, he and Rakitsky are both buried alive, although both are dug out and rescued. 
At 4.20 in the afternoon, German machine gunners break into the tractor factory. At 5 p.m., a counterattack is launched from the stadium. It fails. The Germans have invaded the plant in force. By midnight, the tractor factory is surrounded on three sides, and over the rest of the night, the advance is steadily widened, the narrow streets littered with dead bodies. The Germans fight their way through to the Volga on a 2,000-meter front, and 62nd Army is now split in two, the right flank pinned down north of the Morkaya Machetka. As night turns to morning, and as the day of the 15th unfolds, those units are attacked from both west and north, and yet they hold their positions for the most part. German 6th Army Commander Friedrich Paulus himself is now in the city, supervising the assault and preparing to attack south from the tractor factory. Nikita Khrushchev manages to contact Chuikov that evening from across the river, asking what 62nd Army can do to hold the factory. Michael Jones says that this communication comes after Chuikov has cabled to Stalingrad Front, asking to move his command east across the river. This is a huge deal because the command post on the West Bank is the symbol that they will fight to the end. Anyhow, Chuikov replied, that he could commit the whole of what was left of the 62nd to defend the tractor plant and leave himself exposed on every other sector. Once trapped in the tractor plant, all of 62nd Army would be finally battered to pieces by von Paulus. Khrushchev says he'll send in what he can, mainly ammo, but German planes and artillery that night ensure that no boat can get anywhere near the tractor factory landings on the river. Front commander Andrei Yeramenko himself will cross the river the next day to the Krasny Oktyabr factory landing stage and then on to Chuikov's headquarters. Apparently, already the 13th, Joseph Stalin tells him to do so. It is actually possible as well that Chuikov briefly loses his command in favor of his chief of staff, Nikolai Krylov, but that Yeramenko and Khrushchev, who decided that, are overruled by Stalin. I do not think we will ever know for certain, but there is much speculation because of the various cables and the request to vacate the city, which was why former commander Anton Lopatin was sacked. In fact, Chuikov makes another such request. The situation has worsened. It is impossible to stay at our command post anymore. Allow transfer of command post to the Eastern Bank. There is nowhere else to go. Yeramenko replies, request denied. The commander's headquarters must stay in Stalingrad. Plans are made for the deployment of the 138th Division, hopefully to arrive in force late the 16th. With the dawn, the German assaults begin anew, trying to blast their way south from the tractor factory to Barricade. But the Soviet T-34 tanks have been dug into the road and opened fire at a range of 100 meters, stopping the advance and blowing up over a dozen panzers. And once the advances stop, Soviet artillery from the East Bank and Katyusha rockets on the West one just savage the enemy. And as the Germans bring up reinforcements and the rest of Soviet 138th Division finally arrives, Chuikov issues his orders this evening. 1. The enemy has taken the Stalingrad tractor plant, is developing an attack from the STP to the south along the railway line in an attempt to seize Barricade. 2. 62nd Army continues to hold its positions, beating off fierce enemy attacks. 3. 138th Red Banner Rifle Division from 0400 hours 17th of October to occupy and stubbornly defend the line, under no circumstances to allow enemy to approach Leninsky Prospect and Barakati Factory. And the week comes to an end. There is no land for us beyond the Volga. This statement by Vasily Zaitsev to Chuikov this morning, the 16th, becomes the rallying words of the defenders of Stalingrad. Those words go out today through the grapevine of battered Soviet units in the city as just a simple truth. The soldiers will not cross the river. They will remain, they will fight, and they will die. Chuikov himself will write, we swore to fight to the last drop of blood and only death could relieve us of that oath. We obeyed a call of our hearts. It was not only men who fought and died for the Red Army in this war. 
A great many women also served in a variety of capacities. You can click here for a special about the women of the Red Army. Our Time Ghost Army Member of the Week is Oscar Marco. It is the Army that is the main source of finance for all of our productions, so obey the call of your heart and join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. See you next time. Mm -hmm.